Good morning, everyone. Welcome to week five of the Prep Skills Lecture. Uh, this uh, lecture is coming from Gimoy, also known as CAMS. And this week, it's module five that we're looking at, and we're looking at active reading and listening, an introduction to note taking and paraphrasing. I'm Virginia. Um, I'm a support lecturer for a lot of the online students. So if you're meeting me for the first time, hi. And today on the chat, we've got Jenny McDougall and Bree Knight is also in the house today. Good morning, everyone. So before we go any further, um, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, work and learn. And I pay my respects to the First Nations people and their elders past, present and future. And also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. So a bit of fun to start with. Um, using uh, in the chat, just say according to which number is which sloth reflects your mood right now. Oh, I can see the chat going off. <laughs> is there a particular one, Jenny, that's emerging as the most um, oh, popular? Someone even nominated eight with a chuckly emoji after it <laughs> quite a few threes <laughs> okay it's monday after all i feel Might like pre-coffee we do that's right understand that or with no air con or with no air con mm. but hopefully people are more feeling more of the um positive faces of the sloth there okay that's a good little um little uh mood monitor if you like just to get us started today's about note taking so here is like the agenda of what we're going to go through today. It's a really good framework to build your notes on. So while I'm talking now, I hope that you're writing down these numbers and some annotated or abbreviated versions of what each number is representing. So how are you going to write one strategies for effective reading? How are you going to shorten active listening tips for tips for effective note taking and tips for effective paraphrasing here? So that gives you a good um, little blurb to put at the top of your notes, and then you can use those numbers and some of those keywords through your notes today. So starting with the first topic, the first point, strategies for effective reading. So remember last week when we we're talking about our research strategies, we wanted to identify our focus for research. And this is tied closely in for our focus for reading. We need to have a focus to start with um, so that we are most effective when we, um, uh, when we open our text. And depending on the genre of the text that we're using, our purpose will change. So if we're picking up a novel, then we're going to sit there, till we're going to be relaxed, we're going to have uh, enjoy, we're going to um, take our time reading through those words so that we get the full um, um, meaning and enjoyment from whatever the, the author has written there. So we're going to take our time and so on with this kind of reading. Another kind of reading is uh, something that'll be very familiar for a lot of people is when we get a bill. So when we look at this, our mood is going to be quite different, isn't it, for a start. And when we go into this kind of text, because it is also a kind of text, it's a communication of um, ideas, then we know that we focus very differently. We might read this text in a couple of seconds. Um, and what when you read this kind of text, what sort of things, just pop in the chat, what are you going to look for first? Hmm. So there's a few things coming up there, aren't there, Jen? So from what I can see in the chat, like me, most people go to what amount is going to be you, you need to pay and closely followed by when you have to pay it by. So those two things, thank you, um, annotating person. Um, those two things are what we look for first. And we're very good at using our eyes to quickly skin and skim and scan over this document to find them quickly. And this is the kind of reading skills that we bring naturally to any kind of um, reading that we do. Um, and I also noticed that someone said how to pay. So if you saw the flip side of this document, then you'd go to the bill pay or pay the post office or whatever too. Also very important. 
So you can see that reading this type of text is very different from the previous text that we looked at. So what we're concerned with here, though, is academic reading, reading for academic purposes. Um, tell me in the chat again, what types of materials do you think that you'll be reading at university? What sort of things are coming up there, Jen? Journal articles, academic literature, newspaper articles, websites, textbooks. Good. Manuals, Manuals all nice. of the above. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Text in general. Text in general. You might also be reading uh, reports from government or other organisations. You might be reading data sets, cases and legislation. Nice one, Josephine. Looks like someone's going into law. Good. Nice. You've got a good general idea of the types of texts that might um, fall under reading for academic purposes. So what about this question? What kind of challenges might university students encounter with reading some of these academic texts? Um, my big problem is internet. Um, I work at sea, so um, the availability of internet makes it very difficult. Absolutely, yes. And, so, um, and if you do get a recorded lesson with um, poor sound quality, it's very frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So hopefully you can download materials before you go away, Adam, but I can see that that would be very restrictive on your ability to study all the time. Oh, something you've got to build over. Yeah, sure. So um, the kinds of challenges that you might have. Okay, we've gone into a whole lot of wide challenges uh, with reading. Um, and it's uh, it's really interesting to see you talk about the internet and being able to access resources about money. I'm assuming that's being able to afford textbooks too. But here we talk, I kind of want to focus on the skills or things that you might um, um, have challenges with reading texts. Um, procrastination, time management issue. Um, Jen, can you see some uh, that were more reading related? Yes, yeah, sure, Virginia. Thanks, People Jen. picked up on the vocab and the jargon, mm -hmm. and that's very true. There is a lot of jargon in academia. Um, just the sheer volume of the material that you will encounter, that's Absolutely. also very valid. Yeah. Trying to work out what's relevant to your needs, sorting out um, sorting through the chaff to get to the good stuff. Fantastic. All very valid. All very valid. And we'll touch um, on some strategies to deal with those issues um, as we go through this lecture today. So well um, identified um, people, well done. So let's have a look. We looked at two examples of different texts. So this is uh, a more academic looking text here. Uh, so remember, we're still talking about being very clear about your focus and your purpose for reading. Um, and so what we can do here when we're reading, and this is an example of what we call marking the page, and it helps us extract specific information from an academic text. So we might read through, we might highlight the um, important information. Um, we'll look at, we'll use headings to help us direct ourselves throughout a document and so on. So th remember this marking the page term, because we're going to come back to this when we talk about note taking a little bit further on. So it's really important. What we can't emphasize enough here is to identify your focus, because if you're not focused, then it's more likely you're going to read that chaff rather than um, the real um, the information that you're after. So make sure, and remember this is the same as when we were setting up our research strategies last week, make sure that you read your assessment task really carefully so that you know exactly what you're supposed to be researching. So you've got to be very clear about what that question is asking and what the critical issues are and how this reading material relates to those issues. So we touched a bit on that too last week when we talked about the RAOC framework and looking at relevance of a document um, for our research and our essay writing purposes. 
So you already know about different text types. We've all um, you've got this far, you're in university now, so you've been exposed to different types of texts and you understand that they're, they're laid out in different ways and to navigate our way through a text, we already are accustomed with a lot of features that they have. So for example, when we're trying to find information in a book, we might start with the contents page to help direct us to the specific place where that information that we need is. We can also flick through um, to look at the headings and subheadings. So that book might have a chapter with different headings that might give us um, an idea that where our information or whether our information will be found in that chapter or in another one. And even within those chapters, there might be subheadings too that help direct us or, or refine our search a little bit. At the back of the book, there might be an index page. So you might uh, look for all of the instances of, for a particular information within that index, and that will help you um, go directly to that information rather than having to read through that whole book. There might be tables and diagrams too that help um, uh, summarize that information for you. So they're looking at knowing that there are tables and diagrams in there too might uh, cue you that you might need to look at that information in different ways. And then there are introductions and conclusions that give you a general overview as it, in terms of an introduction and then the more concluding statements in the conclusion, of course. So let's have a look at a journal article. And I know that some most of you have looked journal a journal article last week. But let's um, just look at some of these features too. So um, first thing that I want to talk about is the abstract. So that's this text here. And it acts kind of like an introduction, but it gives you the whole um, a, a summary of the whole article. So it'll start with what, what they wanted to talk about, how they went about the, the study, but also they'll give you some findings from the study. So they'll give you a summary. So when you're looking through a journal article, then reading the abstract is a really good way to find out what that article is about. So thinking about last week when you went through the RAOC process and maybe you did a search and found some journal articles, rather than reading the whole article from the get-go, you can just read that abstract to find out whether it's relevant for you and to make sure that it um, is part of your focus for research and for note-taking. It will also give you an idea about how much of the, the article is relevant to your topic for your note-taking. So whether you can read the whole article or whether you need to look for a specific piece of information. So the abstract is an excellent place to start whenever you're reviewing or getting ready to note-take. Another thing that you can look at for are the keywords. So most journal articles have some keywords listed there as well. So these will give you an idea um, of how, um, where that article, or how you, that article is useful to, for you. Um, when you're using, you can also use these for, to help you with the search. You can add them to your search table or table of search terms uh, that you'll be familiar with from last week too. You'll also find common headings in a journal article. You'll find the introduction, you'll find conclusion. There'll be something called findings or discussion. There might be another one called methodology and so on, but there'll be very common ones that you'll get used to over time. So knowing where those uh, different segments are or parts of the article are will help you um, find where to go more quickly within that text. And then another common um, thing, of course, in journal articles are the references. So journal articles will have a reference list at the end, and sometimes those reference lists go for pages. Um, just note that newspaper articles do not generally have reference lists. They have a different referencing style. So don't think necessarily that a newspaper is not being sourced because it doesn't have a reference list but a journal article always will. So there's more information that um, 
and an activity for you to do in the study guide on pages 131 to 133, um, where you can um, go through this article and others to learn more about how they're laid out. And knowing this and understanding how journal articles are laid out will help you find information more quickly. Are there any comments or questions in the chat relating to these um, genres? Not so far. Okay. Does Did anyone you... does anyone have a question or comment before we go? Yes, Karen, knowing your audience is um, an important purpose. So when you write, you have your audience in mind. Exactly right. Okay. So... Now let's think about, I, I, people did identify that they had some trouble with reading in that chat just then. So let's have a look at the ways that people can improve their reading comprehension. So the first thing to remember is that you don't have to sit down and read everything all at once and try and jam it in and get that task done. Especially if you have a bit of trouble reading or if you're starting to read texts that are a little bit harder than what you're accustomed to, then here are some tips. The first one is to read in chunks. So if you have trouble reading, that chunk just might be a paragraph. So you might read that paragraph, go away, take a little walk and think about it and come back and make some notes. Your chunk might be a bit larger. Maybe it's you'll read a whole section um, or maybe you'll read for 15 minutes and then take notes. But it's better to read in chunks that are where the, the text comes to a natural pause so you can stop and think, think about uh, what it means think about words that you might have might quite not understand um, and go back and review them. You might want to go back and reread uh, re a, a chunk if um, it hasn't quite not made sense to you. Um, but reading in chunks is much a much better strategy than trying to read a whole text at once. Being selective about what you read is also a good for comprehension, but also good for efficiency. So using all of those features of a, a text, like headings and um, tables and all of knowing how it's all laid out can help you get to the information that you need a lot more quickly. You don't have to read everything. Imagine, and as an undergraduate, you won't have to imagine this. You might have several assignments on the go at the same time that you're doing research for. Um, you don't have time to read everything in its entirety. You have to be really careful about going to just where the information is that you need um, and extract that from those texts. Renee, I also have to read things over a couple of times. You're not alone there. Don't think that everyone in uni just reads things once and gets it, especially if something is tricky. Um, and there are tricky things for me out there too. I, there's a lot of things that I have to reread to get the full understanding of what the authors are saying or um, say the studies or how their studies are set up or something like that. So don't feel bad if you have to reread things. Um, Lily, uh, if you think that you might dysle be dyslexic, then have a chat to your access coordinator, please. Okay? They might have some strategies for you. Um, but um, something that people might want to pop in the chat too, if they if they are dyslexic or if they have a diagnosis for ADHD or ADD, um, some of the strategies that you use uh, to help you, because I know that people with those uh, conditions are really clever at getting using other skills and other strategies to understand what they need. The other thing that you can do to help your reading comprehension is watch for the technical words or the jargon used in your courses. So for example, in week three, we started use some, using some very particular words like learning styles, Solomon Felder, um, Jung topology quiz, and all of those labels that went with those quizzes. They had particular meetings and they were jargon in this course. But what you all did was learn the labels and the exact meaning of those labels so that you could apply them correctly. 
And this is what you'll do in your future courses when you, and as you read texts, you'll work out what the specific jargon is that you need to know. And you might even have a little glossary book that you have, or a book of definitions that you um, keep at your desk. So make sure you record those specific terms, write down their meaning, your personal definitions, try not to copy and paste uh, so that you can uh, embed them in your memory. Um, so jargon, Emily, means a technical word that's not used every day. So this is a, another comprehension trick. So you can use a dictionary or some other reference to understand language as you go. But my tip is that if you come across a word in a sentence that you don't know, is read the whole sentence and see if you can figure out what it means first. See if you can figure out for yourself. And, if it's, and then go back, read a little bit further, read that sentence in a bit of a longer context. See if you can work it out just from the meaning. If you can't, then go to the dictionary. Don't try not to get into the habit of going to the dictionary for every word that you don't understand because it can slow you down and stop you understanding. Oh, sorry, before we go on, um, any comments or anything that needs to be said from the chat, Jen? Uh, no, I think you're, you've been across it, Virginia. Um, Lara suggested taking regular breaks especially if you might have ADHD or something like that. Great tip, Lara. Thank you. Sounds like a great tip. Yep. And it works nicely with that read in chunks, doesn't it? Good. Thank you. Okay. So let's move on. Um, so these are positive things to do. Some things that you should try not to do is read every word. So sometimes when we are trying to understand something yes it's okay to go through and read things more carefully but if you're reading quickly just do that read quickly um, go over the sentence quickly and aim for understanding rather than getting bogged down in every word you must have your purpose in mind before you start if you don't have if you're not clear about what you're trying to extract from that text then go back and re-establish what you need what the questions that you're asking or what you're trying to find out. It's no point going in there with a wishy-washy idea. Be very clear. And avoid getting bogged down in detail. So if you are starting to get bogged down, then do take a walk, have a break, um, revisit your question, look at your notes so far, and then keep going. And getting sidetracked. We all know what it's like to get on the net and then just be taken on you know, a little uh, rabbit hole. Uh, this can happen with your reading too. So again, keeping your question in mind and keeping and stopping every now and then to go back and remind yourself the question will help keep you on track. That's a nice comment, Anne-Marie. You've learned not to pressure yourself to read everything in the last few weeks. It's really effective. It's at, harks back to module two and being an effective learner. So just being clear about what you need to extract. You don't need to read all of the other stuff. So remember, we're talking about active reading here and being engaged with the text. It's not about taking shortcuts, um, but it's about being able to find ways to work smarter. So being focused on um, the text. And active reading is a skill to develop. So uh, we'll, you'll, you might not do all of the most effective strategies now, but there's some lovely tips in the module this week to help you focus on some really positive reading skills so that you can develop them, put aside those uh, less effective habits, but also to maintain those good habits. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> and Active reading will save you time. So um, like Anne-Marie said, she's become more effective and strategic in what she chooses to read. So it's saved her time and she has to um, be effective with that time because she's got lots of things to read about. And because of that, it'll mean that you're potentially less stressed and you'll uh, uh, maximise your effectiveness in your studies. 
Okay, that's part one. Let's move on to part two. So now we're going to go active listening and tips for note taking. So active listening is about um, not jumping up and down while you're listening or doing exercise or whatever. It's about being focused. So it's about being very engaged with the information that's presented. It means taking notes and it means asking questions. So asking questions is useful out loud within a lecture, but asking questions is not only about speaking. It's about what's going on in here. So as you're thinking um, about the information that's being conveyed to you in a lecture or just one-on-one, -on -one, you get to um, question, ask questions about that information as you go. And this will help you take more critical notes as well. So don't just let the information wash over you and take down what you hear. Be aware of the kinds of questions that are being raised in your head. Like, what is this? What does jargon mean, for example? What does she mean by that? How does this relate to what I read yesterday that had a similar term? So that write down, writing down those things help you engage more deeply with the information and hopefully help you embed that information better so that um, it's available for review later. And another part of active listening is afterwards, not during the lecture, discussing what's going on in that information, um, checking understanding with people, using some of the questions that you raised for yourself as you're listening and discussing and clarifying with others. Though those might be a study group, they might be your family and friends, but they might also be your tutor or lecturer if, you're, if you need clarification. So active listening is really important at university. Um, <laughs> we use verbal communication more often than not yeah, at university. These days it's more backed up with uh, visuals in PowerPoint form and so on. Um, but because it's the emphasis is on verbal communication, then active listening is really important. Um, and because of that, you need to be able to develop your note-taking skills to keep up with um, that verbal communication. So I hope that you are taking notes here. It would be ironic if you weren't in this note-taking lecture. So Tom's got his thumbs up, thumb up, that's excellent. Um, and let's have a think about note-taking at uni now. Um, first question for the chat, when do you think you'll be taking notes at uni? Every day, Shana. That's my girl. <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so here's a more challenging question. How can you use your learning style or personality types to create your note-taking style? You might not answer this in the chat straight away. This might need a little bit of reflection. You need to think a bit more about what your learning styles were or your personality types and how that might affect your note-taking style. Oh, lots of great ideas here. Colours and drawing, highlighting. It's, I think it's all these visual people who are in the chat straight away. Yep, little pictures, charts, highlighting. Fish, says Jess, Jesse. Graphs, yep, nice Desmond. Ah, now Ben's got record and re-listen. So that tells me that that's a verbal learning preference in play there. But lots of visual people putting their uh, ideas in the chat. Great. So let's go on to something that takes a little less reflection. You're probably very familiar with this, uh, these challenges. What challenges might you face with note-taking? Oh, they're nice, Karen. I like that. Bullet point notes. I like bullet note points myself. Too much information. Overanalyzing. Rereading your mess. 
I'm not sure how to put it into your own words. Messy handwriting, sure. Yep. <laughs> Sounds like we might have a few future doctors with this uh, not being able to read the, read back their writing. Sorry, that's a terrible generalisation. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So let's have a look at um, some hints for effective note-taking then. So your in-class notes or your in-lecture notes or listening notes, I'm not sure why we've got in-class there. Your, your notes should be easy to read. Yep. And, yes, as you get better at note-taking, then people, your handwriting will get better in your notes. You will know that you are looking after your future self and you'll make your notes um, neater. That's Yoda to speak, by the way. Um, so be easy to read is very useful. Being brief but to the point is also important. You don't want to take down whole sentences that the um, lecturer is saying. Um, see if you can keep it to the, the main idea. Um, abbreviations are really important uh, in your note-taking style and you'll develop your own set of what's meaningful for you. Using your own words is also um, a good practice to get into. Because if you're using your own words, it means that you're already paraphrasing, uh, which is useful for not plagiarizing. But it's also good when you paraphrase or put things into your own words. Um, it means that you're um, changing the information and fitting it into your own internal final, uh, filing cabinet. So using your own words is a great way to get deeper learning and better understanding. Another good feature of good notes uh, is that they're well organized. So having some kind of structure that um, you can then follow later on is really important. And we talked a little bit before about personalizing um, your notes based on your learning preferences. So using highlighting, using bullet points, um, using diagrams are all ways to make your notes well organized and match your learning style which means that you should be learning uh, at your optimum if you're you, uh, following your tendencies. And they should highlight important points. So that's what they, um, what uh, the best notes to take. Uh, and the advantages are clear. There's active participation. If you're taking notes, then you're um, absorbing the information, you're thinking about it, and you're putting, down, putting it down in a meaningful way for you uh, to look at later. It allows you to connect ideas too. Remember, there's those internal questions that are happening. So you're connecting ideas, hopefully, um, between what's happened before. So, for example, you might look at the relationship, uh, just as we have done, between modules two and three and four and this one. Yep, they're all connected. So as you're listening, you might be going, oh, yeah, that's like my learning style is this, and that means I can do um, highlighting might be useful for me in my notes. The great thing is that notes can be reviewed regularly. And what would you prefer? To sit down and watch the video again for an hour or look at your notes of that video, which might take you five minutes to have a read through and also reflect on. So having notes is a much more effective way than going back to the original text to review. And because you're doing all of this, then it's more likely that you um, engage in deeper learning with that information. And it means then that those ideas are more likely to stay in your long-term memory, which is beneficial when it comes to exam and final assessment time. So um, all of these, uh, set us up well. So some tips for taking notes in lectures. Make your notes, notes brief. Use a word or phrase instead of a whole sentence. Um, use abbreviations that you'll remember. And you probably already use a whole lot um, and so you can incorporate them easily. Um, use your own words where you can, except where there are particular definitions that you need to write down 
or there might be formulas if you're note taking in science or maths that you need to write um, take down in, in a very specific way. So be judicious about using your own words. Um, it's not all the time. Adapt your style to suit the subject. So I've just talked about maths, for example. The way you note taking maths is going to be very different to the way you take notes in prep skills, might be different to the way you take notes in essay writing. Um, so make sure that you adapt your style to suit different subjects. And it's really important that you personalize it. These notes are for you. Right? So you have to be able to um, be able to review them clearly down the track. Do something that works for you. Exploit your learning preferences so that these notes work for you. Don't be scared to personalize any of the things that we show you here. And if you're having lots of trouble, then ask your lecturer or your access coordinator for some help. So let's just have a look at some common abbreviations that people could use. So these, you know, uh, we all understand if there's a Q in text, that it would lots likely to mean question. And if it's coupled with an A, then there'll be an answer. Um, some abbreviated Latin, for example, a more abbreviated Latin, which means that is, NB for note, approximately, um, equals is a common one, leads to, I often use upwardly, uh, Upward diagonal arrows for increase and the opposite for decrease. Um, I have arrows going everywhere in my notes too. Um, any ideas? What do you use, Jenny? Brief? Anything different? Dollar signs? Um, <laughs> sometimes just leaving out letters, like if you're in, doing education and a word you come across a lot is learning, you might write that as LNG. Um, and sometimes that can depend on the jargon of your particular discipline. That's right. My only advice really is whatever you do, make sure you remember it. I had a bad experience as a student when I first started going to lectures and I thought, this is a great idea. I'll just abbreviate all these things. And I went back to read my notes and I thought, ah, I don't know what any of these words are. So yeah, just keep it simple, I guess, would be my suggestion. So yes, things like this, shortening it, things you'll remember, don't get too creative <laughs> unless you're going to remember. Uh, just a tip for maths. If you're taking down numbers, make sure you record the units too uh, when your lecture notes. Units are really important, as you've probably found out already. Okay. So the other thing that you can use to help you take notes is to listen and look for cues. So a lecturer, and in prep skills, we try and do this, we try and set you up early to take good notes. You probably noticed that at the beginning, we give an outline of where the lecture's going with clear sections. So having those um, there prepared helps guide you for the, um, the rest of the lecture. Um, but there's things in speech that are quite common that you could um, listen to as well. So uh, they'll often start, or lectures will often start with um, some kind of introduction statement. So my topic today is, or today we're going to look at, or this session we're going to focus on. So that's a cue for you to quickly write down the general agenda for the, um, the lecture. Um, as I said before, um, Definitions are really important to write down and um, lecturers will often um, introduce a definition by saying this term is used to me or um, here is the definition is often one <laughs> or you might need this for the assessment, this definition, <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, there will be main points po uh, pointed out with um, what we call transition words or cohesive ties. So things like firstly, secondly, finally, um, on the other hand, alternatively. So these will give you uh, ideas, uh, sorry, words that give you cues that there's a new, new or different point coming up. And it, this is something that's not different from any conversation. You know those cues in conversation. You just have to um, hear, listen for their significance for your note taking. Um, examples, which are really good, uh, noting some examples are really good ways of helping you 
remember a concept because they're given a real life um, application. So, of course, an introduction word or a phrase is an example is or for example. So listen for those examples to see if they help your understanding for those concepts and note down what the example is, not in the full story, but just again in dot points to help you remember. Um, with emphasis, so if something's really important, then the lecturer will point that out somewhere. Uh, they'll probably say this is really important or the crucial point is, um, or significantly, for example. So listen for those um, important bits of information. Often in a PowerPoint, they'll be highlighted in a different way too. And then of course, to finalize things, they'll say to sum up, or they'll start with thank you. There's clear cues that the um, lecture is winding down and they're about to give a summary. And sometimes if you're lucky, your lecturers will tell you what notes to take. So I think that um, some of us already do this, like uh, you'll need to note this for learning portfolio A, or you'll need to note this for learning portfolio B. And if you're really lucky, some lecturers might give you uh, a template to fill out if there's they, they want you to pick up on particular things. Um, any comments that uh, I can see there's a little bit of uh, social chat going on. A little bit of social chat and also a bit of advice coming through. Tom suggested, I think it was Tom, uh, yes, uh, writing the date on your notes, which is a good habit to get into. Absolutely. Um, and I guess along with that, the topic of what it is that you're looking at. And maybe the unit. <laughs> And maybe the <laughs> units, yep. yes, good point. Uh, listening for keywords, yes, definitely. We hear a lot about keywords and they definitely factor in note taking as well. That's right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so let's move on. Here are some um, uh, patterns for note taking, if you like. So uh, just uh, there's going to be a few ideas shown here and some of these will appeal to some of you and some of you will just look at them and go, no, that's not for me. So I, I think that if you think about what your learning preferences are, that will kind of indicate what you like to hear and what you don't. So uh, a more global learner, um, an intuitive learner, sorry, uh, might uh, like these pattern notes. So for me, if I could see all of these texts more clearly, I might be able to see the connections between all of these things. But I would think that this is very individual and that some people would find it very difficult to see what's going on with these notes. Um, but having said that, for some people, this would be fantastic. Highly visual, as you can see, there's little diagrams, there's arrows, um, and just single words to connect all of those things. Um, this appeals to me more personally, um, so maybe for others too. Uh, we've got a clear focus here for our notes, yeah, why take notes? And then we've got um, five different main points, all lettered um, with some kind of uh, left to right organization. And then under each of those main points, there are sub points. Uh, so people who are more sequential might like this because we've got very clear um, deno uh, denotation of those main points and then very clear numeration of each of those sub points for me. So for me, going back and reviewing this would be very easy. It's very much very easy to look at those main ideas and sub ideas very quickly. For me, it's harder to do it with this one. And then something again for a more a creative, more visual or global approach. Um, sometimes if I'm not sure how a lecture is structured, then my notes might look like this. Um, and then what I would probably do is go back and review and rewrite these notes into some more order for me. Um, but a more global person and visual person might find this very, very useful. You can see that there's arrows here. There's a little book here. There's a, um, and it emphasizes a text that this person wants to go um, through uh, a bit later. 
But there's also this little table here, which I find very appealing. I like tables. So I think that maybe my notes could look like that if I'm going working quickly. So making notes work for you. Um, oh, sorry, here's another example. Um, much more structured, very nice, neat summary of a uh, uh, bit of information, I think. But see, notice how this person has used color and graphics, probably a visual person again. So you can see very clearly um, uh, uh, a highlighting of the, the essence of this set of notes. Um, it's useful to vary the type and size of font too, especially if you're a visual learner. So notice how they, these people have put boxes around the main points there too. Um, and then we have a lot of variation in uh, people who like to use, do handwritten notes or people who like to use OneNote or use their, uh, an electronic version. Um, again, that's up to you. Uh, my personal preference is to use pen and paper. I think that there's just a stronger connection between reading and making my notes by hand. Um, I feel like it go, it's embedded in my brain more um, readily. Uh, you could write notes on hard copies of slides too, for example, if that's uh, so you've got more of a, a flashcard kind of or digital flashcard kind of version. And for this one, you can draw shapes around blocks and information to give categories to. So a few people are saying that they prefer pen and paper too. Um, I saw something a little bit earlier. Just give me a sec. Oh yes, yeah, Sina. Sorry, I'm, am I not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly? Um, if you voice recorded your notes, sure. If you're a verbal learner and that's useful for you, you could voice record it. Um, I'm not sure how easy that is for you to review. You'd have to be careful about how you stored all of your voice recordings so that you could retrieve them and uh, find the information that you're looking for easily. This is why I like paper because it's easy to find. Virginia, that could work well if you're reviewing sure. a lot of information for an exam or a test. I'm thinking that could be useful. You Absolutely. have to be a little bit careful if you're taking notes for research. Because remember, you need to be taking down publication details, page numbers, things like that. So, you know, perhaps only in certain contexts, but if yep. it could work for you, absolutely. Mm, absolutely, Jenny, thank you. Um, and of course, using numbering and headings to help you um, set, break your own text down into easy chunks to search through. And don't be afraid to just try stuff out, like try new strategies, be a bit creative, um, personalize uh, any templates that you might find that are useful. Just have a go playing around with things. Uh, remember those strategies from module two. Before we move on, sorry, Virginia, I just wanted yeah. to pull out one that Ben had commented on about dictation software for verbal learners. Again, maybe not something for note taking in a lecture, but if you're reading and wanting to like repeat your notes, sometimes using a dictation software like Microsoft has one where you can do Microsoft dictate so you can talk to it rather than writing things down. I know that is really helpful for some people. Good. Thanks, Bree. So let me show you a couple of formats for note taking that you might want to try. So all of these are in the study guide. This one's on page 140 and it's called the Cornell note-taking system. It comes out of Cornell University. So um, what they would like you to do is uh, take your notes during the lecture here. And notice here you can have, uh, there's instructions too. There's main points, use your own sh form of shorthand. So that means use your own abbreviations. Um, use colored pens if that's helpful for you symbols, shapes, and so on. But all of those notes go here. And then, you know, I keep talking about how your notes have to be for future you and to help you engage in deep learning. And I've been talking about reviewing them later. So straight after class, this is where you add the main points here again. So keywords and phrases and things that you um, that are for emphasis. But even more important is to go back and review again. So it's not just a matter of taking notes. 
Remember this, you're taking notes so you can learn new information, but you need to revisit those notes so that they can be locked into your longer term memory. And this is um, why this is so important here. So that's something that you could try. Um, has, does anyone in the group already use something like this? I'll keep going while people might add stuff to the chat there. So a more homemade version, um, so you don't have to print out the template or anything, is just to use columns. So here you can see on the right-hand side are where is where this person's taking notes. Notice they're kind of doing things in more sentence form, but they're condensing the main idea in this side of in this column so that they can find where that information is more quickly when they review their notes later on. Going to um, another form, and I'm going to talk about marking the page here. But remember that uh, example that I had earlier with nicely small highlights small highlighted few notes in the columns and so on. Um, marking the page should not look like this. You can see that if you go back to review that, it's not helpful at all. It's not picking out specific information. And just quietly for me, having that much highlighting in my face, I find a bit um, stressful actually <laughs> to look at. So when you're marking your page, remember to have the issue or question in mind skim and scan through the text first to find that information that you need. You don't need to mark everything. Then you should practice highlighting and underlining sparingly, um, using keywords and phrases only. Use those little tabs, like you can cut up post notes and put them there, or you might have those little special things that you can put in. I'm using some of those tabs if there's a page that you want it, that's really important to you um, that you keep coming back to. Um, and remember to use symbols and abbreviations. So this is not what we want. We want something that looks more like this. Spare highlighting um, and some, maybe some comments in uh, the margins if it's not a publicly used book, please. Don't mark in library books, I'm saying. <laughs> so the one that we're focusing on in steps we call notes TM. So um, we're going to uh, use it in the activities for this week, but it's also the template that is expected to be used in essay writing for some of the assignments. Um, so you can get your template from Moodle. It's, you can download it from there. And notice that we've got a space here for the citation. So as soon as you start taking notes from a text, then you should mark down the reference for that text straight away so that you can find it again, but so you can use them when you um, make citations or when you reference that text in your work. And it's also a good idea to have a focus for your reading at the top of the page too. So as you're reading and taking notes, you can keep flicking your eyes up to this space so you can uh, we keep checking that you are staying on track and that you're making notes on the topic that your um, uh, that your essay or assignments for. Um, whoops, sorry, I'll just go back. So notice that it's got three columns here. We have a column for the page or paragraph numbers. We have this column where you take your actual notes from the text, whether that text be written or a lecture or something else. And then in this column is where you do your own thinking. So this is where you ask those questions as you're taking in the information, where you're making connections with other texts that you've read or things that you've seen or things that you've heard. It's where you mark down where you want to follow up on something else or you get an idea from re for research. All of that creative thinking about what you're reading or listening to goes into this column. So this is what uh, the image looks like in the textbook. So you don't uh, get the two confused. We've got page numbers, uh, the main ideas and your thoughts. So you can go to the textbook and you can just check your understanding of how to use those three columns in the study guide. 
Anything that we need to comment on, Jen and Bree? I no. Just pe people are suddenly panicking about EWU <laughs> uh, and the assignments, but I don't think there's any need to panic at this stage. Don't um, panic. And if you're keeping up week by week and you're doing the set tasks and you're taking uh, advantage of the resources provided for you, um, then I think you'll find that EWU won't be too much of a problem. No. And they revisit all of this in EWU too. So you don't have to remember it now for EWU. It's part of that course too. We just introduce it here so that you get a bit of a heads up about what's coming. And what we're talking about here has application to the other units you're doing this term, including prep skills. Okay. So um, let's have a look here. Uh, we want to, uh, this is the article that's, that you can download from Moodle. But what I want to focus on here is this information. Because remember, when we talk about, I've, I've been talking about the notes TM and including your reference details at the top. So you need to know where to find them in a journal. So here we've got um, the authors. You can see them here three authors so they're easy to list we also need the year of publication so we can find that usually um, either usually they've got the information set up up here or it'll be down in the footer or header somewhere in the journal so there's usually three places on the front page somewhere in the header or somewhere in the footer you'll just need to learn uh, uh, to look at all of those places and you find the year of publication so we need to remember that. We need the title of the article. So this is the title of the article here, Tattoo in the Self. Now remember, a journal article is one article in a journal, and that journal will have several articles. So it's kind of like a magazine or a newspaper. You've got this larger book that has several articles in it. So we've got the title of the article, and now we need to know the title of the journal as well, or the larger publication, and that's Clothing and Textiles Research Journal. So we record that as well. We also need a whole lot of other information. We need to have the volume, the issue number, the pages, and this thing called a DOI, a DOI. And I keep having to remember, it's Digital Object Identifier. Is that right, Bree? Good. So it's called a Digital Object Identifier. And this is kind of like a modern library um, number for it. So we need to have that some common library number recorded as well. And again, you can see all of these are up here. We've got the volume number. We've got the issue number here. We have the page numbers. And we have the DOI. So these things are all required when you um, put together a reference. Okay, I'm going to move on um, to a general notes TM. So notice that we've got all of those details up here ready to go. It means that I can find that information easily if I need to go back. Um, but I've also got all of those details there so I can reference this um, information if I need to. And here you can see how this has been populated a little bit. We've got the page numbers there. We've got some notes here. Um, notice that they're not extensive. Um, and if they were my notes, I think that there'd be more bullet points here as well. And then there's some thoughts here. So in this section of the notes, uh, the authors talked about these authors. So uh, the idea for this person who's taking these notes is to check out uh, more data, um, studies by these authors. Um, and then they've also thought about this idea and thought about connections to other brand names um, related to those tattoo, that tattoo information. So this is a general overview about how to use Notes TM. Um, go in, have a look at Moodle, at, uh, download the template and make sure you work through the examples so you get a good feel about them. Uh, just ready so you've got some background information for when you go into EWU, but also for the activities this week. Okay, let's move on to paraphrasing. And um, I know that some people need to leave right now. This lecture always takes a little bit longer than the others. So um, those people who need to leave, please come back um, and watch the end of the lecture, starting with 
tips for effective paraphrasing. It's a good place to search. All right, let's move on. Oh, look at that. So paraphrasing is putting your uh, what your the information that you're receiving into your own words. And we do this every day. It's not something that's um, um, that's a new skill when you come to university. You already take information that, like, for example, a story from your friend, and then when you relay that story to another friend, you don't use the exact words that your friend used initially. You'll change things into your, um, your own words. And part of that is because you want to help remember it using your own um, terms, which helps you remember things better. But if you don't uh, paraphrase well, well, then you set yourself up for um, possibly um, committing some plagiarism. And we don't want that. Nobody wants that. So remember that plagiarism is about taking the thoughts, ideas, their writing, inventions, photographs, tables, um, number sets, data sets from another person or organisation and using them as your own. And you might not intend to do that, but if you take someone's ideas and write about them and haven't acknowledged them, then it means that you're basically saying it's your idea. So you, mu if you, you must paraphrase well so that you can avoid plagiarism, but that also should be backed with acknowledging the source through referencing. I noticed in LPA that people have been doing some soft kind of referencing, which is fantastic. According to the study guide, according to this website, that's great for prep skills. For prep skills, we don't need you to reference things correctly yet. We haven't taught you extensively how to do it. We do appreciate it when people acknowledge their sources, so, so well done. But we, you know that we will be looking for um, instances of plagiarism. Um, so you must paraphrase still. No word for word stuff, no copying and pasting, please. Paraphrasing um, will help protect you. So what is it? So it's putting the ideas of others into your own words. It's an important skill to avoid plagiarism. And it's an important skill when you're note-taking because it helps you learn things better. So let's go back. Um, this text here, this is not notes TM, by the way, it's a different table. We're looking at an original text, we're looking at the note form, and we're looking at the paraphrased version. And this example is on page 150 of the study guide, so you can look at it later. So this is an original part of the text from that Tattoo and the Self um, article. And the reader has highlighted some specific text here. So there's a growing demand for laser removal in Australia, the cost of removal many times it does uh, of tattoo application. And this has been decreased into one bullet point here, increasing demand for laser removal. Costs much more than application. There's actually two points that cover that. So notice that the notes are abbreviated. They're a truncated version and they've been put into different words. I'm not going to go through all. I'll just go through these. And then the person has paraphrased them in their own version of the text here. The tattoo removal industry is rapidly growing in Australia. Increasing number of people no longer satisfied with their tattoos. Da, 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 da. So you can see that this person has taken the original text, put it into bullet point, and then from there um, made it into their own words. So that transition through note taking to paraphrasing is a really important step. Don't miss it. Some people try to go straight from the original to the fact paraphrased, but we emphasize the importance of going from the original to note form and then to the paraphrased version. Okay, so for paraphrasing, start with keywords only for your notes. And you'll notice that some of these points are about note taking, but it just emphasizes the link between these three versions. We're talking about, we're thinking about the ideas behind the words. We're not trying not to think about the sentences. 
um, you might use symbols and graphics to help you again instead of um, full words. And you'll be actively reading as you're doing this. So um, you need to be thinking um, as you're doing this. If you get stuck, like um, I think it was Lara said earlier, close the text for a little while, walk away, reflect, maybe discuss it with someone so you can put it into your own words verbally before you go and try and write it. And part of this is about owning the knowledge. So owning the knowledge, again, is about that deeper learning and committing it to learn um, your longer term memory. Um, some other tips, um, and these tips are in the study guide too. So um, you might take words from a sentence and substitute synonyms or antonyms. So synonyms are words that have the same meaning and antonyms are words that have the opposite meaning. You might change the word order of a sentence or change the sentence structure around a little bit. Or you might combine um, words from a phrase to make one word or vice versa. You might take one word and give an equivalent phrase. So for an example, you might go people who are devoted to, you might use devotees instead or vice versa. Um, you might change the word form. Um, so a growing number to growth in numbers. Or you might substitute different linking words that mean the same, of course. So instead of in dish addition, you might use also. Um, so just examples from that article, uh, you might, the term in that original is widespread popularity of tattoos, could be changed to prevalence of tattoos. All sectors, all parts, sorry, these are a bit off, off aren't they, sorry. Um, shows, indicates practice, form of body art. It's very contextual here. Um, and much more accepted could become becoming increasingly expected accepted. But we have to be very careful when we're using synonyms and antonyms because sometimes, especially the synonyms offered in word or grammarly, might not have the exact same meaning. Some of the terms given or offered might have a slightly different nuance. So for example, um, we take this sentence, the reef is getting damaged from climate change. Not a great sentence to start, I have to say. Um, could be if someone just used the thesaurus unthinkingly, the reef is obtaining breakage from climate change. So even though getting damaged and obtaining breakage has the same meaning, in this sentence, that replacement doesn't fit. Um, it becomes quite clear when people are just taking words from a thesaurus, thesaurus or um, synonym generator um, and haven't used them thinkingly. So make sure when you edit that your synonyms fit nicely. Here's another example, but from that text again. So the sentence is, the widespread popularity of tattoos among all sectors of the Australian society shows that this practice is much more accepted than decades past. Let's have a look at the example using a thesaurus unthinkingly. So the widespread popularity of tattoos, the predominant approval of tattoos. Sounds a bit fancy, some of those words, but you know as English speakers, it just doesn't sound right. Let's go to this part here. So we've got areas of Australian civilization, oh, sorry, sectors of Australian society, then becomes areas of Australian civilization. Again, it just doesn't sit right, does it? Just doesn't sound right. Shows, this uh, word in italics, matched with displays, it fits. Shows and displays, that's um, a, a reasonable exchange. This practice could mean this exercise, but in this sentence, it still doesn't sound right. These also are acceptable synonyms, but again, recognized with the rest of these words just doesn't fit right. And decades past and eras bygone, slightly different meaning. They could refer, eras bygone could mean hundreds of years ago, but here decades past just means 10. So be very careful about using the synonym match and thesauruses when you're um, paraphrasing. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you just need to be mindful that it can distort the meaning of what you're 
um, taking from that article. And distorting the meaning could be, um, and you're referencing it, could be as bad as plagiarising someone. You don't want to misquote someone or say that they said something that doesn't have the same meaning. So be very careful. So another uh, way of, and I've jumped to tip four here. I've only gone from tip one and tip two. The other tips are in the study guide, people. Um, so this is a way that you can change the sentence structure to help you paraphrase. Uh, I'll read the, the original. Tattoo removal has been promoted as a market opportunity because of low startup costs and the potential for significant profits. So they've changed this around a little bit. Because the initial outlay is low, but profit motive is high, tattoo removal is seen as an attractive market opportunity. So notice that they've flipped the ideas in this sentence and started with the idea of cost and then talked about um, the startup. Notice too that the paraphrase version has to have that reference in there. There are more tips in the study guide um, on those pages there. Um, anything in the chat or anything you want to add, Jen and Bree? Uh, Virginia, there's some specific questions being asked about referencing articles for essay writing. It's very hard for us to be advising you on that, having not seen the articles, but just in general, you don't always have issue numbers for journal articles, if that helps. And we don't usually reference some uh, ISSNs. That's not usually part of the publication uh, details that you need. Um, yeah, Cam referenced a, um, talked about a, a friend's clip, which is one of my favourites, where Joey tries to use a thesaurus. I've actually put it in um, our notes for PSU for this week. Excellent. It's a good one to look at, and it's a good example of how uh, using a thesaurus can go terribly wrong. Fantastic. He signs his name, Baby Kangaroo. <laughs> Is that Cam from Cairns? If so, Cam, bring it to class tomorrow, please. I'll look forward to that. Um, look, if people have got questions or uh, are confused about the, how to reference their articles for essay writing, please get in touch with your support lecturer. That's the best thing to do. Okay, let's move on. I know time's tracking. So remember that plagiarism is a serious offence at uni. You've all talked about that in your learning portfolio, A. Eh? So just be mindful um, that Turnitin is an inter internet-based tool, uh, as you know, that checks your work against um, other texts on the internet. Um, Turnitin is your friend. Just remember that. It's not um, an obstacle that you need to get through. Um, consider it your friend. If you, are, if you submit early, then you can check your draft to make sure that you have a low similarity score for plagiarism. And if there are instances of plagiarism, then you've got an opportunity to correct them. So don't be scared of Turnitin. It's a very useful tool for your time at uni. Um, you know, self-plagiarism is also an offence. You can't resubmit the same assessment. Um, if you're in prep skills and you do need to submit something again, then make sure you talk to your support lecturer or Bree or Jenny about um, how you might do that if you're not sure. And finally, collusion is where people, people work together to cheat in terms of assessments or plagiarise. So often people think it's, um, from what I've read in LPA, that it's when students do it together, um, when they work together to um, submit an individual's assignment but it can be anyone else it could be a former student it could be your parents your siblings your girlfriend or boyfriend it could be anyone if you're working together with someone on an assignment that's just yours then that's collusion and a form of plagiarism just don't do it the last run and i don't think this was in the in the agenda at the beginning i think we only had three points sorry people fourth point Introduction to Referencing Conventions. So um, here's what the Harvard Referencing Guide looks like for the university. And this is the style that we use in STEPS, the Harvard Referencing Style. Um, it's available for those people who need it in essay writing, it's available from the um, Moodle page there. So referencing is um, about needing to acknowledge the sources whenever we use um, those sources in our own writing. 
Um, it will be explored more fully in essay writing. We're just giving you a taste now, um, just so you can see how what all of those numbers mean when you're looking at a journal article. And in prep skills for you to har Harvard referencing, though a lot of you, when you get into your undergraduate course, will be using one called APA. Harvard and APA are both what's called author date systems. Um, and they're very similar. Once you know how to do R Harvard, you can quickly convert to the um, peculiarities of APA. They both have their peculiarities, but we just know that Harvard is a little bit simpler. So it's a really good one to be introduced to. Um, so just be aware that there, many of you will have APA as your referencing style when you're an undergraduate. So when you reference, um, there are two ways that you can do it. There's what we call an information prominent te um, in text citation. So what that means is you will have the information and in your paraphrased version of the text and then the, the citation or the author's details, the source's details will be in a shortened form at the end. And already you would have seen as you've looked through some journal articles, you'll see these little inserts in the text that show the author and the year of publication. This is matched with the reference list at the end where, so if you want to know more about what Coleman wrote, then you just go to the reference list and then you check what the title of that source is. But for an information prominent, we just take the information and then the citation is at the end. There's another kind of reference that you'll notice when you read through some journal articles. I'll get back to that in a moment. And that's the, um, what's called an author prominent citation. So this time the author, we want to mention the author in the text, in the sentence. So here the author prominent ones, the author um, is included in the sentence. So if I read through, and I'm not going to read out loud what's inside the brackets, it'll just be Coleman and others found that there are still negative attitudes towards having tattoos in the workplace. If I read this sentence, because this isn't in brackets, then I'm not actually going to read it aloud. The idea of these in-text citations is to be unobtrusive as possible. So they're very much shorthand. They have just the minimal information in them. Because you can imagine if you're looking and uh, reading a lot of um, citations, and they're really long, they'll start to interfere with the flow of the sentence. So notice here that there's um, this weird um, Latin abbreviation here, et al. Um, so et al just means and the others. So in this, in the Harvard referencing style, it means that Coleman has got at least three other authors with them writing that journal article. Oh, sorry, there's an activity in the study guide, activity 5.8 on that page. So you can go and um, apply yourself a little bit more to that one, that idea. But again, you'll learn more about this in essay writing, so don't freak out about it now. So that's what appears in text. So look out when you're looking through journal articles, just have a look now to see the difference, if you can spot the difference between an information and an author prominent one. But let's go to the reference list. So let's say uh, we're looking at uh, Coleman in the reference list. This is what it would look like. Now we've got Coleman, and the, um, uh, we've learned to fix that there, don't we? We've got all of the authors. See how there's four authors, which means we've got Coleman and the rest. We've got the date. We've got the article title. We've got the journal title. We've got the volume number, the issue number, the pages, and the DOI. You'll get lots of practice with that in um, essay writing. Anything we need to pick up on in the chat, Jen and Bree? I just need to apologise. Those um, full stops shouldn't be there. That's right. Was that your the initials there? <laughs> I'm just trying to <laughs> get rid of them. Sorry about that. We'll fix That's that where if time. you use APA and Harvard, you do get a bit confused sometimes. That's right. Um, people are talking about their Turnitin scores for their portfolio and also for... Um, Essay writing, it's definitely good to be aware of those. Of course, it's not a mark of any kind. It is just the percentage of your work, which is in common with what the application is picking up online. 
So it's quite normal for so it to be a bit high for LPA because you have a template as part of that assignment. And so it wouldn't students... matter if it had a high, a high, um, what's it called, a turn it in score due to it, due to it being a template? It will be higher because it's a template, Ethan, both in um, essay writing and prep skills. You know that in essay writing, there's... Yeah, because uh, uh, I looked well. at my turn it in score because it was uh, un alarmingly uh, big. Mm -hmm. Most of it highlighted saying that it was plagiarism is the actual, uh, uh, like just the questions. Yeah, so it will be, that's the template. So that's why it's high. The similarity picks up all the similar words in your document and they're similar with every other student that's using that template. So that's why it's higher in uh, for learning portfolio A and B and why it will be higher for yeah. um, those templates. But if you're concerned, then again, get in touch with your support lecturer because they'll give you an idea of the ballpark that you're looking at. Also, when you look at the report, you'll be able to see from your own writing, not from what's on the template, what's being picked up. So you can check and change before you hand that in. Okay, you don't have to change what's in the template, but anything that you've written that's highlighted as read, you need to go and um, check. In summary, uh, active listening means engaging with the information presented. It means taking effective notes. It means asking questions both out loud and in your head and discussing points with others, both whether you understand and if you don't understand. Um, active reading means reading smart or reading effectively. And part of that is identifying your focus for reading, learning to skim and scan to find that information through headings and then looking for keywords, taking effective notes, recording those questions as you go, recording all of those publication details so you can reference later on, and to paraphrase and reference to avoid plagiarism. So in all, it's using your time wisely isn't it? and drawing on a whole number of skills about your learning preferences, your research skills, and knowing um, where you stand, what you do effectively, and what you can do to improve. Thank you, everyone.